trying to fix my microphone and walk, and it didn't work. All right, I'm on a clock here, so we're going to get right into this um, and uh, get through it. I appreciate, again, being invited. This is a, it's always difficult to talk about this, um, but God has shown me that it is necessary. There are many lessons um, that need to be shared. Um, so we'll get right into it. Um, our scripture reading will be taken from Matthew chapter 5. We'll look at, uh, starting at verse 10, it says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So our message tonight is entitled Tribulation Song and it's a testimony. So I, will, I have to be quick. I'm not gonna be able to give you all of the details of this testimony, but um, I'll, I'll jump right in to where I had received the job to be the director and the health officer for the city of Pasadena's health department. And this was a, a major career advancement. Um, we were able to pass some really good um, ordinances in the city. Um, this is a place that actually Ellen White did some work with um, people who um, uh, worked against tobacco at the time when she was alive. So there was a, um, a, a group that, that, that worked there and, and Ellen White had connections with them. And so Pasadena obviously is famous for the Rose Parade and the Rose Bowl, a very affluent city. Um, and we were able to pass ordinances banning cigarettes smoking or smoking at all in apartment buildings or com condos because the smoke would wafe over. Um, I, I had the weight of big tobacco come after me for that one. Uh, and then we had um, ordinances around what the city could serve. They had to meet certain nutritional uh, standards. The police department came after me for that one. Um, <laughs> and then um, probably the biggest work we did, and I, I'm, I'm trying to cut this real, get, really get into this quick, was the work we did around um, HIV-infected individuals. Interestingly, the, the year before I started medical school, I, be, I worked at a clinic on South Beach in Miami um, called PET, the PET Clinic, the Prevention, Education, and Treatment clinic on South Beach where there was um, a large uh, gay community and HIV was really obviously exploding um, uh, at that time. That was like the mid to early 1990s. Um, it, was, it, was, it had already exploded, but it was continuing on. And so when I got to Pasadena, they had a very small program around HIV treatment for low income people with HIV. And what I found is that there was a lot of uh, fracture in the, in the gay community, there were some very affluent people who go to private, high-end ID infectious people to get their treatment. But there were a lot, m many of them people of color or poor white people who were, had to come to places like ours to get their treatment. While I was there, I brought in seven to eight million dollars worth of um, programming. Housing, mental health, expanded medical care, we had a food pantry. A lot of things I learned at church watching people do Dorcas ministries. Um, we literally brought into the health department, and we had really good people that wanted to do it. I had, I had staff that were just phenomenal. And many of my staff were from the LGBTQ community, as you would imagine, and I want to say we got along perfectly fine. Many of them, and not all of them, knew I was a pastor. In fact, I was the associate pastor at the Altadena Seventh-day Adventist Church, which was less than, you, know, you could walk from the health department to the Altadena Church, um, and my name was on the, on the board as the pastor. So everybody knew I was a pastor, people knew I was a Christian. Um, and it was not a problem. I mean, all the time I did that work, I remember we, we got a grant from one of the um, uh, uh, county um, supervisors for one point, however many million dollars, and we built a dental clinic in the health department to serve this community because there um, was a, a lot of discrimination against HIV positive people when it came to dentistry. You may, some of you may remember that early on in, the, in, that, in that pandemic. Um, so it was, it was a blessing. Now, 
with that came a lot. And I, I, I give you that background first to tell you that even when it, the fire came against me, no one ever said I was unkind to them. No one ever said I didn't treat them fairly. No one ever said I was bigoted or prejudiced. N my track record, in fact, even in some of the newspaper articles was, he, I don't know what he believes, but he was good and he brought services we needed. And I say that because at the end of the day, your first role in your job, whatever job you have, is your profession of faith. So one of the things that happened with all of that was the great success that I was having at work is that it began to propel my career. And this became dangerous. I, I was enjoying the testimony I just heard because she's 100% right. If you begin to disconnect from God in any way, and I was pastoring, and there were six months where, I, as a medical doctor, I was the only pastor at the church. And the church grew. The church was growing. We were doing, God was blessing the church. But having to go to certain parties to raise funds in the Hollywood Hills, um, you know, some of the celebrities I would run into in L.A., these things began to affect me. People began to really think highly of me. I was on the local government TV channel all the time. I was like a local celebrity. I'd walk out of you know, a store and people would run up to, hey, Dr. Walls, we were watching your talk last night on whatever, whatever, whatever. And that began to go to my head. And I tell you that because my testimony isn't a simple testimony of I was a, uh, something bad happened to me and God made it better or delivered me. My testimony is one that God sends us trial to purify us. He sends trial to purify us. And my, it began to go to my head because I, I wanted to be, you know, go further in public health. There were a couple people that said they were going to, um, I had already served George W. Bush and Barack Obama on PACHA, the President's Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS. Um, I, there's stuff I could tell you that the U.S. government, I, I probably, if I tell you something, probably, I probably disappear. But um, some of the stuff that happened around some of those programming that was really fascinating in the international realm. Um, but it, as these things went to my head, people started to say, you know, we're going to submit your name, two people, to Barack Obama to be the next Surgeon General of the United States. And I really wanted it. And then the, then the head of the LA County Health Department opened up. And I wanted that. And I'll, I, I don't have time to get into it. But what begins to happen is that Satan doesn't just use success. I mean, I mean let me rephrase that. He doesn't use failure many times to bring about a disconnect from God, he will use your success. It is shocking what Satan will give you if giving it to you means that you will be decoupled from your relationship with God. I've seen this happen to pastors. Their ministry goes really well and it goes to their head and they decouple from God. I've seen it happen to all kinds of professions and it was happening to me in real time. Um, I was just not as good at anything I was supposed to be, not being the, the priest at the home I was supposed to be, not being any of the things God really called me to be. I was still at church, still preaching, still doing well, but this thing was beginning to really uh, affect me. And so the first stanza of the song is that, that God saw where I was. And, and the, one of the Bible verses that hit me was this one, Revelation chapter 3, verse 19 is now one of my favorite Bible verses. It says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. <laughs> I learned the hard way. One of the clearest signs that God loves you is that he allows you to go through difficulty. In fact, if your life is too easy, you should be worried. This is, answers the question, why is it that the wicked prosper? The wicked prosper because they have no skin in the game to be purified. So they, 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 these trials, God would send trials to correct them, to develop them, to grow them, to purify them. But because they have determined to be wicked, those trials don't come. And I, I would see that. And when I was going through the trial, I, I thought of some of my, my, my co-workers who were, were outwardly sinning and all kind of crazy. I said, Lord, why doesn't this happen to them? But this verse answers that question. If he loves you, he will rebuke and chasten you. So all of this talk, the interesting discussion we just had about, you know, affirming and love and all these things, God does not pave a road for you that has no potholes. If you're going to go down the path God has for you, you're going to hit trial. So the idea that whoever or whatever you are should be painless and seamless is not 
a, a, a message that comes from the throne of God. It comes from the enemy. So why does God allow us to go through these things? I, I put, the, put some of the good stuff first just to make sure I wouldn't run out of time, Pastor. That's kind of what I did. I re-strategized here. Here's why God does this. Meeting difficulties develop spiritual muscle. It says, it is his providence that brings us into varying circumstances. In each new position, we made a different class of temptations. How many times when we are placed in some trying situation, we think this is a wonderful mistake, how I wish I had stayed where I was before. Let me tell you something, I wish I stayed at Loma Linda. I was on faculty at the medical school, so I should have just stayed at Loma Linda. But why does that happen? Look at what Sister White says. This is one of the most profound statements she gives. But why is it that you are not satisfied? It is because your circumstances have served to bring new defects in your character to your notice. But nothing is revealed but that which was in you. Church, let me tell you something. There's nothing wrong with the storm. The storm is never the problem. The problem is what character is in the boat. That's why we used to sing the song with Jesus in the vessel. You can smile at the storm. And the problem for some of us, when trial comes, it is evidence not that the storm is terrible, but that the boat is empty. That's what I learned. If the storm is terrible and Christ is in the boat, you have nothing to worry about. You know the disciples didn't learn that lesson. That's why Peter comes, I'm assuming it was Peter, comes running to him and says, Master, carest thou not that we perish? They didn't understand who Jesus was. As long as he was in the boat, the laws of physics would be defied. The boat actually couldn't sink, even though it was full of water. Just like Lazarus couldn't die if he had not delayed two days to get to Bethany, he would never have died if Jesus was in that house. So, you see, you're getting a lesson up front. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Uh, the point is, when the trial comes, if Christ is in the boat, if he's in your heart and mind, the storm becomes irrelevant. And like I said at the end of the sermon yesterday, your focus must be on Christ. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Too many of us spend all our time looking into the storm. Here's what she says. Look at this. God's love for his children during the period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity, but it is needful for them to be placed in the furnace of fire. Their earthliness must be consumed that the image of Christ may be what? Perfectly reflected. You know, he cannot return until there is a remnant who perfectly reflect his character. That is the seal of the living God. That's why trial comes. You going through something right now? Ask Jesus, what are you trying to teach me? What is it in my character that needs to be removed? Ask him that now. That's what, this is why the church is in the condition it's in. We are preaching a fluffy, soft, um, my pillow type of Christianity. Here's what she says. Valuable objects in nature are, pure, are pruned or refined. Uh, uh, she quotes from Isaiah 48, 10. This is one of the um, uh, uh, devotionals. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. The furnace fires are not to destroy, but to refine, ennoble, sanctify. Without trial, we would not feel so much our need of God and his help, and we would become proud and self-sufficient. I hope somebody got that tonight, because somebody's going through something tonight. Look at what she says. She says, in the trials that come to us, we should see the evidence that the Lord's eye is upon us and that he means to draw us to himself. It is not the whole, but the wounded who need a physician. It is, the, it is those who are pressed almost beyond the point of endurance who need a helper. She says, this is powerful, the fact that we are called upon to endure trial proves that the Lord sees something in us very precious. Where he desires, which he desires to develop. If he saw in us nothing whereby he might glorify his name, he would not spend time in refining us. I hope you're getting this. I hope somebody's getting this because you need this. You're going to need this. The blacksmith puts the iron and steel into the fire that he may know what manner of metal they are. The Lord allows his chosen ones to be placed in the furnace of affliction in order that he may see what temper they are of and whether he can mold and fashion them for his work. 
I, I love it. Watch this. Watch this. She says, it may be that much work needs to be done in your character building. Church, that's where I was. Much work needed to be done. That you are a rough stone which must be squared and polished before it can fill a place in God's temple. You need not be surprised. Oh, I love this. If with chisel and hammer, God cuts away the sharp corners of your character until you are prepared to fill the place he has for you. To make it clear, she says this, no human being can accomplish this work. Only by God can it be done. That is righteousness by faith. The trials are the instruments of it. And be assured that he will not strike one useless blow. His every blow is struck in love for your eternal happiness. He knows your infirmities and works to restore, not to destroy. All right, so that's the first big lesson. There's one or two more to go, so we're, we're, ahead, we're ahead of schedule. Let's keep pushing. All right, second stanza is the storm itself. So I'm in Pasadena, everything's going good. In 2012, the mayor asked me, probably the first Adventist ever, to speak for the mayor's prayer breakfast, and I speak. I speak all of the state senators, state assemblymen, uh, some of the national senators are there, uh, all of this, the rest of my team on the, on this, on the um, executive um, uh, level at the city, um, county officials, big auditorium, uh, fancy hotel, and I give, deliver a speech that clearly shows I'm a Christian, but uh, you know, I, I, I do it to get the community together. I get a standing ovation. In the audience was the president of the Pasadena City College. Two years later, he calls my office and asks me to be the keynote, the, the keynote, the commencement speaker for the graduation of that two-year college in Pasadena. I'm skipping a lot, but I don't have a choice, so, 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 so hold on. So he calls me because he, he, he didn't tell me what was really going on, which is where this whole story really gets interesting. And he asked me if I would be this commencement speaker. He talks to my secretary first. I said, yeah, fine, I'll do it. I was actually very excited because at the time, not only was I looking to move up in my career, I'd begun to do public speaking at college campuses and other places, and they would, you'd be shocked what they pay people. I did it once and was hooked. It, it was like money crack for me, unfortunately. And I, I was ready to get as much of that money as I possibly, the easiest money you could make. For us, so, you know, as a speaker, I was like, just stand up for an hour and you guys pay me thousands of dollars, I'll do it all day. Um, and so I was trying to chase that. And again, I didn't ask God if that's what I was supposed to do. Because you can't speak on an American college campus without some form of compromise if you're a Christian. So, yeah. so I said, yeah, I'll do it. Now, what I didn't know, he didn't tell me, was that they, the, the guy who was supposed to speak was, the, was a Hollywood movie producer who had, re, who had, who had, got, he had um, been given an Oscar award, an Oscar. When I saw the list of the people that they had wanted to try and get to speak, people like Magic Johnson was on the list. And I'm like, why? I told the guy, I said, why would you want me to speak, the president? He said, well, two years ago, I heard you speak at the mayor's prayer breakfast, and I thought, our kids need to hear from you. Yeah, well, he stroked my ego. That's the problem. I should have been praying. Is this a trap? Because it was. Um, and so here's what happened. The guy who was supposed to speak um, uh, made the, the movie Milk about the life of Harvey Milk. And some of you may remember Harvey Milk was assassinated. It's an unfortunate and terrible incident in American history, quite frankly. I don't care what your beliefs are, but someone assassinated him and the mayor of San Francisco. And this was the movie because he was the first openly gay elected official in the United States. And he was assassinated. And so they made a movie out of his life. And Madonna's ex-husband, I forget the guy's name, he played Sean Penn. He played Harvey Milk. I've never seen the movie. But I also never had an Oscar. And I thought, you know, later on, I said, this man should have probably picked the Oscar winner. He, and not only that, this director was a graduate of Pasadena City College. So it really didn't make sense. But if I'd have known all of that, I wouldn't have said yes. I knew nothing. They put my name in the newspaper that I was going to be the speaker. And they rescinded the offer for him to speak. Can you imagine what happened when the, the students at the school from the LGBTQ community heard that the guy that they had probably lobbied to get to speak was no longer speaking? I became public enemy number one. And I read their Facebook page. I said, you know, Dr. Walsh has done some good stuff in the, in the town. However, you know, we need our guy to speak. And what they said is since, and, and, and the reason, the, the reason he, uh, 45 minutes, let me try this now. The reason, because the story, the back story is really interesting. The reason they, 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 they disinvited him 
was because early in the school year, the professor for, for their pornography class was caught sleeping with some of the students. Yes, they had a college credit pornography class and the teacher was sleeping with some of the students. Um, if you listen to my sermon yesterday on the media, our sister talked about the media, the media would mess you up. And so they didn't want another scandal. And what they found is that this movie producer was allegedly online in a compromising position with what they thought was an underage uh, young man. Under, you know, you know, so I don't know if that was true or not, never looked it up. But that's what he was, so he pulled him and put me in. When this community found out that that happened, they were livid. And they said, you know, I, they said some good things about me, but they said, since they found things on him online, we're gonna find things on Dr. Walsh online. So they went online to find dirt on me. And I'm sure they thought they'd find some domestic violence charge. I don't know what they were looking for. But you know what they found? Sermons. Lots of sermons, and I'm telling you, they must have, based on what they did, they must have listened to at least 20 hours of my sermons. So on Judgment Day, somebody's going to be without an excuse, um, or they're going to be right with the Lord, one of the two, um, because they listened to some, a lot of sermons. And what they did is they took my sermons, and they just took bits and pieces out of the sermon, out of context, and they put it in a, in a draft article and sent it to a magazine called Out Magazine. Some of you may have heard of Out Magazine. And when Out Magazine got it, with the pull that they've got, instantaneously it got to the Los Angeles Times. Now here's what you gotta remember. The Los Angeles Times is the second largest newspaper in the United States, probably one of the top 10 newspapers in the world, and they got this story from Out Magazine, and the next day they write an editorial about me. The lady says, the lady writing the editorial tried to get in touch with me, and once that first article came out in Out Magazine, I knew I was in trouble. The spirit of the living God told me, you, you, you're done. I knew I was done, I didn't even fight. And when the next thing happened, where they were trying to, um, she, this lady was trying to get me on, uh, to, to interview me for this editorial, it was like God whispered in my ear, like a lamb led to the slaughter is dumb, so said he not a word. God told me, do not engage. And I had to watch as they, for the next several weeks, and this is where you all heard the story. It was plastered in newspapers all across the country. It ran under people's ticker news thing on Yahoo Mail and AOL and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it went everywhere overnight in a second. And this woman in her editorial said, there are two reasons Dr. Eric Walsh should never hold a scientific position in the United States of America. She said, number one, he believes God created the world. She said, me being a creationist, Bible-believing creationist, means I, can, I should never be a scientist in the United States of America in any government position. I, there's a lot more she says. I'll, I'll, I'll skip that part to jump to the second one. The second thing she said, reason why she said I should never hold a, sci a scientific position in the United States, she said, because she quotes one of my sermons where I say, I do not want my children to wish upon a star. I want them to pray to the living God. And she says he hates Disney or something to that effect. Now, you know, in, in Southern California, the king and queen are Mickey and Minnie. So... Um, she jumped all over me for that, and that was huge. Once that editorial came out, it went viral, obviously. And instantaneously, the city manager called me in to say, listen, you know, you, um, you're in trouble now. He, he, it was funny, he said, because a week earlier, the Pasadena Star News, the local newspaper, had this glowing article about the, um, the, the, the um, HIV dental clinic that we had opened. It was a one-year anniversary. They were lauding my efforts and all of this. The city manager said, you know, a week ago you walked on water. Everyone loved you. He said, now they're calling for your head. And he said, I don't know how you're going to survive this. I said, I don't know. We, I, you know, I, I can leave because I knew. I knew there was no coming out of this thing alive, um, at least not from a career standpoint. And so um, I had to, God worked a miracle for me to get my severance pay. They, you know, these people were trying to block, so I couldn't even get my service. The city manager's like, you didn't violate any city. There's no city, you know, you know, regulation in your employment that you can't stand in your church and preach what you believe. So there's nothing we can, we can, we can do about that. Um, and so um, I, I was left to have to resign from that job. But a few weeks earlier, I, I, no, the week after this whole thing started, I got a call from the state of Georgia because in January of 2014, I'd started the process to become, uh, uh, to be hired for a, um, a, a district health officer for the whole Northwest section of the state of Georgia. And the third interview came up as this story broke. 
they sent for me, flew me to Atlanta and interviewed me. And I told them what was going on. And they, you know what they said? And there were some people from the LGBTQ community on the committee that, that, that I was interviewing with. They said, this happens all the time. Those guys get really upset really easily. Don't worry about it. You know, we'll figure it out. That's, that's what they told me. And before I got home, they offered me the job. And I said, Lord, thank you. You got me out of a blue state into a red state. I'll be safe now. <laughs> Let me tell you something. There's no safety in politics. The Seventh-day Adventist is in a catch-22 conundrum. If you think Republicans or Democrats are the answer, you've not met Jesus Christ, because he's the only answer. The only answer, there ain't no other answer. And so, so I, I, get, I thought I got this job, I was all good. When the state of Georgia put out the thing saying um, that they, they'd offered me the job in the, news, in the newspaper in Georgia, the next day, as I was fighting for my severance, it came out, um, the next day it came out and they said, and they said, this is what they wrote in Los Angeles. And even the Times or the Pasadena Star News, they wrote, we have friends in Atlanta. He will not get that job. They said, we will follow him wherever he goes. And church, they meant it. And they did follow me. Let me, let me show you. This is me on Channel 2 News. Um, this is what they said about me on the news in Atlanta. Controversial hiring. And they say, you know, they, they, they don't talk about what it really, you know, they don't, they don't put the real reason in there. And I can tell you, it was incredibly difficult. I, long story short, they reach back out to me and they say, hey, you know, we're getting all this buzz. All these people are calling the state health department saying we shouldn't hire you. Um, of course, most people didn't know what was really going on. They, they, they were wise in how they did it because I found out later on, there are a lot of folk in Georgia that would come to your, come to your defense in a situation like this. Um, and so they said that, you know, we're going to look into it. I flew to, from Los Angeles to New York to do a, a, a youth federation for the Haitian youth um, uh, groups up in um, the Northeast. And when I landed at JFK, I turned my phone back on, and there was a call from the state of Georgia. And the lady on the phone said, listen, we, we've, we've reviewed everything, and um, we're sorry to tell you um, we can't offer you this job, or however she said it. You know, you're not, we're not going to hire you. And she thought she hung up the phone, but she didn't. And I could hear them laughing and mocking me in the background. Church, for the first time, now this thing had been going on for weeks already. I sat on that plane at JFK and I wept. And I said, Lord, how is this happening to me? This is beyond bizarre. At, least at this point, they're trying not to even allow you to make a dime. I mean, they want to cut off your ability to make money. At the time, I didn't think of about it, but now that I'm doing my last day's events at my church, I should have thought about it. You will not be able to buy and sell. Economic attack is actually one of the greatest forms of martyrdom. Never forget that. So if you're too comfortable with what you have, be careful. Because if you're not willing to part with your stuff, the devil will use your stuff to anchor you to this earth when Jesus comes. So here's a couple of Psalms. People were sending me Psalms and they were sending me quotes from the spirit of prophecy. All of them are in here. I cut them way back. Psalm 35, 11, false witnesses did rise up. They laid to my charge things I knew not. They rewarded me evil for, for good to the spoiling of my soul. Um, that was a, a good one, Psalms 35, 15. But in my adversity, they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. Yea, the abjects gathered themselves together against me and I knew it not. They did tear me and ceased not. He says, with hypocritical mockers and feasts, they gnashed upon me with their teeth. And I love this verse. This verse helped me up. Lord, verse 17, Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling from the lions. Three things got me through this. Prayer, praise, and the Psalms. I call them the three Ps of dealing with trial. Prayer, because you've got to be connected to God and you've got to be calling on his name constantly. Praise, because I don't know if I took that verse up, because the Bible says God inhabits the praises of Israel. If you feel alone, praise God. Don't just pray to God. Turn the thing around and praise him. Take out, I would take out my hymnal sometimes as I was going through this over the years I went through it, and I would just sing my mother's favorite hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, all by myself. No band, no drums, no organ, nothing. Just praising my God. But the Psalms, I've learned, if you're in trouble, the Psalms are awesome. So, 
The third stanza is depression and loneliness. Now, this thing got really bad at this point. I, I was uh, now out of, the, I resigned from the job and passed the interview. God bless me to get the severance. George had pulled the job from me. And in this process, as this all is going on, I'm, I'm doing things in parallel now, one of the shocking things was that as these newspaper articles were coming out and, these news, and the, some of the news channels were playing clips of my sermons, one, one Channel 5 in LA called the church and said, can we play his sermon and clip? And, I, and my, the secretary called me, Channel 5 wants to play one of your sermons. I said, tell them no. Are they gonna pay? No, then no. They played the sermon clip anyway. It was a good clip, so I said, like, well, at least somebody heard the word. I mean, what else can, what else can I do? Um, but as I was going through all of this, one of the, the terrible things is that the, the, when this got to the North American division, and I, I can call out where it went, I mean, uh, uh, and you'll see, I'll, follow me now. Um, when it got to the North American division, somebody there decided that I, I, was, in the, I was in the wrong. I can tell you that because the, the president of Southern California Conference at the time, as well as their PR person, Bet, Betty Cooney, who's a wonderful, lovely woman of God, they showed me the emails they sent to the NAD in defense of me. Betty Cooney said, I have listened to his sermons. They are making a monster out of a man that is not a monster. She defended me to the hilt inside our own denomination. Instead, what happened was they sent her a letter that she was to give to the local news um, that was pretty harsh and made her put her name on it. What bothered me the most is the cowardice of the men in, at, the, the, at the division office. And I, I normally don't say a lot of this stuff in the thing, but I, I think it's important. The cowardice of those men so that she put her name on it and when everybody who wanted to defend me gave the backlash, she got it instead of them. Isn't that cowardice? In the, uh, in the, when, the, when the newspaper gets a hold of it and they put it out, they say, listen, they, they quote the letter. They don't play, put the whole letter in. They say, um, you know, it says, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has said he is not ordained. Um, he does not represent us. He does not speak for us. Basically threw me under the bus. It was painful. Let me tell you, that was a painful thing. In fact, I, I don't have time to go into it tonight. They, we had a, they, they called all the pastors together at, um, for the whole conference at the White Memorial Church. I normally don't say this when I give the testimony, brought in people from, PU, from the PUC, from the NAD, and I mean, one of them gave me a tongue lashing in front of all the pastors. They told me I'd be able to speak and tell them what at my side of the story, they wouldn't give me the microphone to speak. So I'm stronger than pretty much all of them, so I took it. And I gave them a bit of, and I, you know what I said to those pastors? I said, if you think what is happening to me is not gonna one day happen to you, and these people aren't gonna turn on you, you're a fool. Anyway, um, that was a difficult thing. But there was other difficult things that happened. I was married at the time, and my wife at the time said, listen, you're not gonna make any more money. She took my kids and the Range Rover and left. Drove across the country and left me in Pasadena by myself. Later filed for divorce. And some horrible things happened in there, totally separate, separate from this. It was, listen, before it was all over, I was in Pasadena in that house by myself. Just me and the Lord. It was one of the most difficult, dark times you could ever imagine. My reputation was mud. i never forget, I went to the Capitol Hill Church to present something in DC. And um, one of the guys, and I, never, I never say this when I give the testimony, one of the members came up to me after I'd spoken all day and he said, man, you're actually a nice guy. And I said, what do you mean? He said, someone from the, from the, uh, from the NAD or the, uh, came last week and told us not to listen to you. It was church, it was brutal. It was brutal beyond comprehension. I mean, I, I, I fight to not even weep as I think about those lonely, dark days. And that's why the name of this one is depression and loneliness. Psalm 22 says this, verse one, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is Elijah, and this verse came to me when I was going through this, in 1 Kings 19.4, um, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, 
and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life for I'm not better than my father's. Two weeks ago, Southern New England Conference had a mental health symposium Sabbath and I was the speaker for divine service that this is the verse I came from. Mental health, depression, these things are real. Even Elijah suffered from it. When he thought he was left alone, this is where Elijah went. He never, he wasn't suicidal, let's be clear. What he was is where I was. I told the Lord, I said, listen, Lord, I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to kill myself, but if you feel it's time to take me, Lord, I'm ready to go. That's how dark it got. Isn't it interesting? The one, the, the one prophet, there was another one who actually did it. We found as we were studying the minor prophets, but the one prophet who says, Lord, take my life never dies. Isn't that interesting? He never died. God sent, him an, God sent him a Holy Ghost Uber and picked him up and took him to glory. Isn't that shocking? Look at how the Psalms addresses these things. Psalms, Psalm 55. For it was not an enemy that reproached, it was not an enemy that reproached me, then I could have borne it. Look at these words David says. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me, then I would have hid myself from him. Look at what David says. Verse 13. But it was you. A man, mine equal, my guide, and mine acquaintance. I want to make sure I hit the second, the second lesson for you to get out of my testimony here. Troublous times are before us. In many instances, Ellen White speaking, uh, uh, writing, friend, uh, in many instances, friends will become alienated. Without cause, men will become our enemies. The motives of the people of God will be misinterpreted, not only by the world, but by their own brethren. Look at what it says. Look at what it says. She says, the Lord's servants must be put, will be put in hard places. A mountain will be made of a molehill to justify men in pursuing a selfish, unrighteous course. The work that men have done faithfully will be disparaged and underrated because apparent prosperity does not attend their efforts. That is the worldly form of prosperity. She goes on and she says, by misrepresentation, these men will be clothed in dark vestments of dishonesty because circumstances beyond their control made their work perplexing. They will be pointed to as men that cannot be trusted. And this will be done by members of the church. Look at what she says. She says, God's servants must arm themselves with the mind of Christ. They must not expect to escape insult and misjudgment. They will be called enthusiasts and fanatics, but let them not become discouraged. God's hands are on the wheel of his providence, guiding his work to the glory of his name. The guy that ultimately was responsible for all of that, did not li he didn't even live long after all of this stuff cleared up. God's hands are on what's happening. I, the, the, I can tell you some of the stuff that happened after. It, it, aftermath, it was crazy. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, this is a key, key passage um, from um, Testimonies, Volume 5, page 136. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should, our, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness the most unflinching. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. Look at this. Don't miss this next line. This is, you don't think this woman is inspired. You're crazy. Look at this line. At this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. I hope you got that. The spirit of prophecy is telling us that when they turn their back on you, when they show themselves to be cowards, you become more courageous. When they, when they come at you uh, uh, and they are disloyal, you become more loyal to the cause of God. When they are cold, you become more warm. Look at this. Because some people, I remember one guy reached out to me. Um, you ever hear me give a testimony? I always say this. Guy reached out to me and said, Dr. Walsh, because of what they did to you, I'm not returning my tithe anymore to the church. I said, man, you know you ain't paid nobody no tithe in 20 years. Don't be trying to use me as no excuse for you not returning your, pay your tithe. God is in control of this thing. If you have enough faith to believe in God, believe that he's in control of the church. Some of us have given up. We think God's not in control of this thing. And we, we look at the people in the church and what they do and, we, we, and it messes up our relationship with God. I'm not worried. This is his church. 
He's the one that's all powerful, not me or you. Look at what she says. She says, talking about the church, the noble ship, she says, there is no need to doubt, to be fearful that the work will not succeed. God is at the head of the work, and he will set everything in order. I wish I had time to tell you how all of those people got their come-ups themselves. If matters need adjusting at the head of the work, she says, God will attend to that and work to right every wrong. Let us have faith that God is going to carry the noble ship which bears the people of God safely into port. Amen. The fourth stanza, the cleft of the rock. One of my friends asked me, what are you going to do now? You don't have a job. I'm Jamaican. So I still did have the pastor and job and I was working moonlight and urgent care. Jamaicans always have three, at least three jobs if you don't know Jamaican. But I didn't have my main job and I'd always wanted to be a missionary particularly to Guam, they reached out to me before, and I told my friend I wanted to be a missionary in Guam, but you know, I was always so busy. And you know what happened? Within 30 minutes, the Guam Seventh-day Adventist Clinic sent me an email, Dr. Walsh, would you like to be a physician in Guam? And within several weeks, I was in Guam, jet skiing, swimming, hiking, and playing basketball. That's what I was doing within several weeks. God gave me a respite for 11 months, I was in Guam, and God gave me a chance to heal. I hope you're getting this. And that's why I call it the cleft of the rock. In the Chamorro language of the indigenous people of the island of Guam, in the, the word for Guam is, means the rock. God literally hid me in the cleft of the rock. I have to skip the rest of the stuff on that stanza. So the fifth stanza is the battle itself. So before I left to go to Guam, um, all these religious liberty attorneys began to reach out to me asking me to take my case. And I said, Lord, I don't know how to choose an attorney. I've never had to have an attorney. God said, whoever reaches out to you and is willing to spend time with you, sit with you, sup with you, that's who you go with. And it was interesting because everybody else was saying, look, son, we're going to fax you some papers, you sign them and send them back. This group here didn't do that. This is First Liberty. Um, and this is out there out of Dallas, Texas. Um, and this is the guy who runs it. This is Kelly Shackelford, uh, an ardent uh, fighter for uh, religious liberty in this country. You can look up some of the stuff that they've done. These were my two attorneys, Roger Byron and Jeremy Dice. Jeremy called me and said, listen, we will fly to California. We're going to sit, take you to dinner, and we're going to find out what's going on. When they sat with me, I played them the, um, the voicemail of what happened um, with Georgia when they were laughing at me. The two attorneys high five. I said, that was very painful. What are you doing? Why are you high-fiving? They said, every time we take a, a case, God gives, a God gives us a piece of evidence that we're going to win the case. That is the piece of evidence. What they meant for harm... Isn't that how, see how God works? What was meant to hurt me, or what the devil would have used to hurt me, God used to secure the lawyer's faith in the case. And they were worried. The LGBTQ community is so strong. Even these mighty, this mighty law firm, and many of the law firms they tried to partner with were too chicken to mess with it. These guys were worried all the way through because of just the, 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 the ferocity. If you're dealing with some other religious liberty issues, it's not that big a deal. But this one is different. It is very different. So these are the Psalms. Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for mine help. For without cause have they hid from me their net in a pit, which without cause they have digged for my soul. And, he, and David says, let them be ashamed and brought to confusion together that rejoice at mine hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Different type of prosperity. So long story short, these guys take me on. I, I, I'm in Guam. We're going back and forth. Every time I'd fly to Atlanta and we'd have to do a, 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 um, like a, a press conference that they believe you use the press to fight back, to put pressure on the state of Georgia. I'd already settled with, with Pasadena in a sense when I got my severance. Um, and they told me, they said, the state of Georgia has all these attorneys. You know, you'll be here. For, we could be here forever because, you know, they, this is a state. Like, they, you know, they, they just have attorneys. They are always going to have attorneys and they can fight this thing forever. And so the media was the only way we could speed this up. And every time it would open a fresh wound, I'd, be, I'd have to go back through the rates, all the comments against me, all this stuff would start all over again. Um, and I, at one point, they, they, when we were doing the, um, it's not disclosure, when you have to turn over, it wasn't a deposition, it's when you, discovery, discovery. I had to do the discovery. They said, we need every sermon, the state of Georgia said, every sermon you've ever written, you need to turn over. 
Now remember, there was a mayor in Houston, Texas that did that, and these five pastors came out and it blew up the mayor, and she actually got run out of office. And my attorney said, you know what, we're gonna do the same thing. So they called this big thing, brought one of those guys up from Houston, and we, one of the pastors up from Houston, and we went to the state capital of Georgia with the, with the governor's office right there and the attorney general's office right there, and there's a big thing, and I stood there in front of all those people and I began, to, and I had to give a little five-minute talk on why, uh, you know, on religious liberty and on the sacredness of preparing sermons. And when I was done, my lawyer said, that, that was spot on perfect. You know what's funny? There were 40-something people standing with me, standing behind me when I gave that talk. And you know what God whispered in my ear? You were never alone. Every Christian organization, every denomination in the state of Georgia, except Adventists, everybody else was there. The only reason Adventists weren't there, I realized in hindsight, is I should have called some of my friends from Oakwood and told them to come. Then I'd have had some Adventists there. But it was powerful. And the thing began to change. And I'll say this, uh, let, me, let me show you this. The media push was so strong, um, they got me on Fox and Friends. You can see I didn't really want to be there. It was like 5.30 in the morning. Um, um, and they, this is how they made this thing rise up and really push this issue um, for everybody to see what was going on. Um, on CNN, um, they, they discussed me, and um, what is interesting, and I don't want this to play, there's a video there, but I don't, I don't want it to play. Um, w uh, what's interesting is, the person who ultimately came to my, well, let me say it like this. One of the reasons the state of Georgia finally backed down is that it was 2016 by then, and there was a presidential election happening. And someone they never thought was gonna gain traction did. It was a guy named Donald Trump, you may have heard of him. And Donald Trump said, what are they doing to this guy, Dr. Eric Walsh, down there in Georgia? You know, he talks, have you seen this? It's incredible. Have you seen what they're doing to Dr. Walsh? I don't know, this is not an endorsement or a bashing of Donald Trump. That's just what he said. And when the state of Georgia realized, this Republican-run state realized that a Republican president could come into office with, with Trump's brashness and not be in favor of what they were doing, they were quick to come to the table. I was on my knees praying to God in worship one morning, and I said, Lord, it's too much now. By then, it had been two or two and a half, three years almost. I said, Lord, it's enough now. I need this thing to be over. This lawsuit business is too stressful. My phone vibrated while I was on my knees. When I picked up the phone, uh, after I prayed, I called, it was Roger Byron, one of the guys I showed you. I picked up the phone, I called him, and I said, Roger, what's going on? He said, he said um, we, I have some news for you. And I said, what is it? He said, um, uh, they, want, they, they want to meet with you. They, they want to go to mediation. And I said, what does that mean? I knew what it meant, but what does it mean? He said, they may, may want to settle. I can't promise you anything, but they may want to settle. I said, Roger, you don't understand. I just got off my knees praying, asking God to get this thing out of my life. I was tired of it. He said, well, God answered your prayer yesterday because the call from them came yesterday. And what God whispered in my ear was, before you call, I will answer. <sighs> let, me say, let me tell you something, church. We, we finally went back to, um, to um, Georgia. And when I went into the mediation, uh, the guy who was the mediator runs up to me and shakes my hand. He's being so nice to me, and I thought that was odd. And then we had to go against the state of Georgia. And, you know, they come deep. They roll, they roll like Crips and Bloods. There's like 30, 40 people, lawyers and finance. You guys don't know who they are, I'm sorry. <laughs> the lawyers and finance people, all kind of people who come into the room and, 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 and I go in there, there's this long table, just like on TV, long table. I go in the room and all these people are shaking my head. Dr. Walsh, so nice to meet you, from the state of Georgia. And I said, what is going on? I sit on the other side of the table and they say, Dr. Walsh, do you want to say anything in your defense? I said, nope, not saying anything has worked well so far. I'm not saying nothing, let my lawyers do all the talking. And they did, they started talking and they went back and forth a little bit. We separated into separate rooms and, 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 and I mentioned the thing about them shaking my hand because David says in Psalm 23, he says, thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. When I got back to the room, the, 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 the moderator, the mediator said, well, listen, we, we're going to move a piece of paper back and forth with the amounts. I thought that was kind of primitive, but okay. And so the first paper comes from them. We had prayed and everything, my, myself and my lawyers. It's a nice thing about having Christian lawyers. I don't know why seven of us don't have a law school, but um, I, we prayed and, I, and, and, and they sent the thing and it was six figures amount to settle with me on this case. The lawyers high-fived again. I said, why are you so happy? They said, if this is the first offer, Dr. Walsh is over. They came to settle today. Before it was all over, the amount doubled. 
I remember, I remember him, the mediator, coming back in and saying, Dr. Walsh, this is their final offer. Do you want anything else? I said, nah. I said, listen, I ain't expect all this kind of money. I said, nah, I'm, I'm perfectly fine. I said, that's good. And one of my attorneys, Jeremy Dice, Jeremy said, we want an apology. I said, that's right, we want an apology. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So he goes back over to the other side and says, Dr. Walsh wants an apology. He comes back over, he says, Dr. Walsh, they said they would not give you an apology, but they will give you another $25,000. I said, I said, listen, they, could, they can keep their apology for $25,000. <laughs> I'll take the cash, brother. I'll take the cash. <laughs> you know what's interesting? One of the state senators met me when I spoke at the state capitol and shook my hand. He said, Dr. Walsh, I listened to your sermon. I've listened to your sermons. He said, you keep preaching. You, uh, you preach powerful. I mean, this is not an Adventist guy. State senator, he said, your sermons are powerful. He said, you keep preaching. The next day after we settled that thing, he went in front of the Georgia House or whatever they call their assembly in Georgia and apologized to me on behalf of the state of Georgia. So I got $25,000 and an apology. <laughs> Let me tell you something, it was, a, it was a powerful thing the way God set up. In fact, the mediator came up to me afterwards. He said, listen, I've listened, I went in and listened to some of your sermons online as well. He said, I preach like you preach. He said, you keep preaching. Isn't that, isn't that powerful how God works? You know, there were people in our own denomination afraid of truth. And here these guys are telling me, no, you keep preaching because this is what God wants you to do. I, I have to finish this up, so let me just say this. And I promise you, our speaker tomorrow night will not go this long. That's a promise. <laughs> but let me say this. I, I, you, I, won't finish, I can't finish this if I don't tell you this part. While I was in Guam, I, I reconnected with someone that I'd met at the um, Spanish SDA church in Hartford, and um, just sending me emails and stuff, and I didn't think much of it. Um, she'd send me these devotionals, and eventually we were praying together on the phone. And it took many, a few years before everything really matured, but she, I, I found her to be a spiritual person, and I didn't really remember what she looked like. She finally sent me some pictures, and I was like, eh, pictures aren't that good. So I said, like, yeah, we'll just be friends. And then I was, I was preaching in Miami, and I decided to shoot up to Connecticut to visit her. And when she picked me up at LaGuardia Airport, I said, man, this girl is gorgeous. She looks like a model. I said, what happened to her pictures? But you know what it was? It was God. God wanted me to make a decision, not based on anything, but spirit, the spiritual condition of the individual. Isn't that powerful? And I can tell you, we've been married now over five years. Um, and God, you know what the Bible says in the book of Joel? In the book of Joel, the Bible says, God will restore unto you the land that the locusts have taken. There's one, I want to read just one, one quote and one verse and then, I, and then, I'm, and then I'm done. And I'm at, is it okay if she just sings to close us out? Okay, come on up, Jackie. Um, here's postlude. It is the triumph of the Christian faith that it enables its followers to suffer and be strong, to submit, and thus to conquer. Isn't that powerful? She says, do not dishonor God by words of repining, but praise him with heart and soul and voice. Look on the bright side of everything. Do not bring a cloud or shadow into your home. Praise him who is the light of your countenance and your God. Do this and see how smoothly everything will go. I want you to learn to praise God when things are at their darkest. Our favorite verse, now my favorite verse is this one, Micah 7 and verse 8. I actually spoke on this for um, 3, 3 ABN a few weeks back. Micah 7 verse 8, rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me.
I am inspired when I see men like Pastor Kelly and the members of um, Coming Out Ministries stand and are willing to do this work that you guys are doing. This is, it's an inspiration to me. Elijah was depressed because he didn't know there was anybody else. God says, I had 7,000 who have not bowed their knee to Baal. Church, we have to support one another. We're not going to bow our knee to Baal. And we're going to stand together as long as we have to until Jesus comes. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for delivering us, for taking us through trial and difficulty. Lord, you knew where we were going before we got there. And Lord, you'd already made a way of escape. I want to pray for everybody in here who's standing for you, Lord. I want to pray for everybody in here, Lord, who's going through trial and tribulation right now. Remind them that if Jesus is in the vessel, they can smile at the storm. Bless us to this end, we pray, dear Jesus. Amen.